Good evening and welcome to the virtual Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Will Frankel and I'm one of your three Athenaeum fellows this year. The Saber Wharf hypothesis proposes that the particular language one speaks influences the way that one thinks about reality. For instance, some linguists have suggested that native speakers of English, in which we generally describe time as moving forward, tend to think about the past, the future, and the nature of causality differently than native speakers of languages that don't follow this convention. While the Saber Wharf hypothesis has been subject to intense scrutiny and controversy, it raises the unsettling possibility that the way we shape our own society might be determined by the conventions of grammar, syntax, and usage dictated by our prose. By stepping outside of some of these rules and replacing them with the conventions of verse, tonight's speaker will examine the ways that poetry can set a path forward for new ways of thinking about our economies. Gabrielle Calvocaresi is the author of The Last Time I Saw Amelia Earhart, Apocalyptic Swing, and Rocket Fantastic. Calvocaresi's awards and fellowships include the Audre Lorde Award for Lesbian Poetry, a Stegner Fellowship in Jones Lectureship from Stanford University, a Rona Jaffe Woman Writers Award, a Lannan Foundation Residency in Marfa, Texas, the Bernard F. Connors Prize from the Paris Review, and a residency from the Civitella Deranieri Foundation. Their poetry has been published in the New York Times, Boston Review, and the New Yorker, amongst others. Calvo Caressi is an editor-at-large at Los Angeles Review of Books, a poetry editor at Southern Cultures, and an associate professor and Walker Percy Fellow at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Their Athenaeum presentation tonight is co-sponsored by the Center for Writing and Public Discourse at CMC. Using the written Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, we will be accepting questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send a question, please state your affiliation with the college. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. And now, please join me in welcoming Professor Gabrielle Calvocaresi to the Athenaeum. Um, gosh, I'm so happy to be here. I can't even tell you. Will, Nandini, Priya, Brian, um, dear, dear Chloe Martinez, who I've known for quite some time. It's really, uh, I mean, I think we all know, right? We're all sitting here in this box together. We were supposed to be in this, I guess, a, a box, a 3D box, but we we're going to be in a box where we could say hello to each other. We could um, shake each other's hands. We could put our hands on each other's shoulders if we wanted to and say, oh, it's so good to meet you. Um, and now we're in this other box where I can reach out. <clears throat> I can reach out and say hello, but we're definitely um, farther apart. Although also interestingly, uh, this is such a intimate space as well. I'm gonna take a little sniff of um, peppermint oil just to start out. I'm a little bit nervous of all things. Would you like some peppermint oil? Here, it's good. It clarifies and um, I don't know, brings us into the present moment, which is one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot <clears throat> as I think about uh, just what it is to be a poet in this moment, to be a body in this moment, um, to be in community and, and how we might make community um, all the time, but, but very much in this moment as well. I'm so, so thankful to be here. I can't tell you. Uh, oh, I should say hello from Durham, North Carolina. I live in Old East Durham. I am in my office. This is my orange couch. I've got a great book by the poets uh, Rita Wong and Fred Waugh sitting on my couch. It's called Beholden. I highly recommend it. And uh, I was just talking to Will and Nandini about the fact that when I lived in Los Angeles many years ago, between um, 2005 and 2012, I was for a term <clears throat> in 2011, uh, I was a visiting poet at Claremont McKenna College. So one of the things I know is I know that glass space in the middle of campus that I would walk by and it had the most comfortable chairs in it. I mean, it really seemed like just so magical to me, that campus. Um, and I also remember I went to the Athenaeum once. There was tea there and I went and I had tea there. So it's good to be back in a place that I really love and I think about a lot. I think, uh, I think a lot about that space. And one of the reasons I think about that space, and it's interesting to think about it also in terms of 
um, spaces of aid, spaces of care, was that I was asked to be um, a visiting professor at a moment in my life when my second book had just come out. Um, and by many measures, I was uh, achieving like a lot of success. But I also was at a space, I don't know if any of you have had this experience, like you're at this moment in your life where things are supposed to be really great. And at the same time, you also feel very lonely, very isolated and um, very confused about kind of what your next steps are going to be. And then out of the blue, I was asked uh, to come and be a visiting professor at Claremont McKenna. And one of the things I just remember is every day I would drive from our home on San Vicente Boulevard uh, near Little Ethiopia in Los Angeles. I would get in my car twice a week, my little Toyota Tercel. I would drive all the way to Claremont McKenna. And it's interesting sort of being here in Zoom and then thinking about this because it was like Zoom. It was this very, very silent space. Sometimes the radio would be on, sometimes it wouldn't, but it was this bubble and I would be in that space. And as I would drive toward your campus, maybe we can all imagine it right now. I would drive towards your campus. I would see the hills in the distance. Um, I would think a lot about what was important to me. What, what did I value and what did I want next from my life? And as I, as I thought through those things, it's interesting to me, my third book, uh, Rocket Fantastic, I think in ways that I couldn't have even imagined, began to kind of come to fruition for me. This is a poem that although I wrote it later, I think of it as a Claremont poem because I think of uh, the hills in the distance and I think about sort of driving toward the mountains and um, yeah, traffic of all kinds. The sun got all over everything over the boys and girls by the pool, over the bougainvillea, which got so hot, my palms stayed warm for minutes after. It made a mess of a day that was supposed to be the worst and lured me outside, so I forgot her death entirely. And also the polar bears scrambling on the ice chips, and also there, were, there was no water in the Golden State. The pool was full and the sun poured across the women's bodies so you had to shade your eyes, or I did. I had to put my hand up to see what they were saying. I know it's no excuse and I had made a plan to cry all day and into the evening. I marked it in my book, which seems like something I'd make up in a poem, except this time I actually did it. I wrote grieve because we're all so busy, aren't we? and so broke. I needed to make an appointment with my anguish so I could take my mind off buying groceries that I really couldn't afford. Anyway, I didn't mean to go outside, except there the sky was just ridiculously blue, taunting me with pigment that I felt the need to name. And from somewhere close by, a voice I couldn't see because the sun was like a yoke cracked over it said, what are you drinking? And I said, I'm grieving. I'm very busy remembering I made an appointment because last year I forgot and then felt awful. The sun opened its mouth and made a gong of the canyons. It poured across the girls and slicked across their Dior lenses. I put my tongue on it exactly when I should have been tearing at my clothes and lighting candles. I got on top and let it find the tightness in my back and open where my wings would be. Somewhere my mother was dying and someone was skinning a giraffe. And I let it go. I just let it go. Have you ever had that experience where, um, it's interesting, I, I say that, I, I think I wrote that poem in maybe 2015, but in 2011, I was already thinking through, I was already thinking through um, what that meant. And one of, one of the reasons I was thinking it through, um, A, was there was that moment in the poem about like all these sort of beautiful things are happening. And also I can't afford my groceries. 
economies. That was something that was really happening for me. I was super successful and I was super broke, which I think is very much an LA experience. I was also kind of coming out to myself in various ways. I'd been out as a lesbian for quite some time, as a queer person for quite some time. Um, I had been out as the survivor of suicide for quite some time. My mother took her life uh, when I was 13. That was a closet I had to come out of that I think I, I did. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later as I read poems. Um, but I was also during that time as I was driving to Claremont, I was beginning to really sort of think about and reckon um, with my experience as someone who had always kind of imagined a different body uh, for myself than the body I was born in. And as I would drive, I would, I really, during that time began to fantasize a lot about what would it be to sort of come out, dress like this, think about, um, being the person I had always deeply fantasized about being shave like the buck I am. I turn my head side to side. I hear the leaves rustle. I shake my head a little and birds reel round the forest. I am no branch. My head turns to the side. I see out my side eye. The deep pool of the eye sees itself pool in the mirror. I oil myself till I am all a lather. My chest heaves out so my full heart can abandon the ribs stockade. Where the bullet would go, if the hunter were a good shot, that's where I place the razor. I make my skin taut. I pull my own neck back and to the side. I come for myself. Yes, I was a lady once, but now I take the blade and move it slowly past the jugular, up the ridge of my chin where the short hairs glisten. I was once ashamed. It was a thing I did in private, my own self, my quarry, no more. Look how the doe comes round, and also the doves, and also the wolf who lets me pass. The fox offers me the squirrel's hide to buff myself to shining. There is no such thing except the smoothness of my face. Like, what would it be to shave with a man's razor? That's something I thought about during that time. And something about that time, that solitude gave me the bravery to do that later. If we were all together in the room, I, one of the questions I would ask is, um, are people daydreaming a lot during this pandemic? One thing that I realized is I was like a, I was a professional daydreamer my whole life. I mean, I think in, it's one of the ways that I began to really come into my gender identity was just dreaming it and dreaming it and dreaming it so for myself. Um, but I noticed during this pandemic that I actually like barely fantasize at all. I have, I have very little dream life. I wonder if that's true for you. I'm imagining you all like nodding or saying like, no way, perhaps some of you leaving the room. I'm so glad you're here. My perimenopausal body cistern, disappointing. How surprising. Bled all day, stopped bleeding and bled some more. Went to the doctor who had to reach inside the woman body I try to live with make peace with, but also ignore. Sad tenant, my uterus. One day the tenant turns out to be the landlord. All day I keep wondering what it means. This clock I know as well as I know anything, but also never wanted, but also won't give up. In the history of my light body, it will show I could have been another but I hold on, not out of fear, well maybe, but also this body I fought for. Little skin sack that grew into a kind of magnificence I'd not expected. I tie my bow tie around my neck that's not quite the neck I want, but still the neck survived. The hours on the floor begging for my life, the bent head crying in the bathroom, the bent head walking, walk, walking by the boys yelling hog and dog and ugly as an animal. It's confusing. 
I protect the breasts that I live without in my eyes, mind's eye. I look for hours at men's trousers and kimonos. I bleed all day and my mind says, take it out. And though it's one step closer to the true self, I imagine also I miss it in ways I can't explain. Burnt off scroll. I'm a mirror of a mirror. When I was eight at daycare, my friends pulled me aside to talk about a sex change, all of us in our Catholic uniforms. Meg, Emily, Nadine, and Brian, who kicked, got kicked out because of me. That's later in the story. We drew me in the sand. We planned and wondered how much it cost to be another body. But now I know my body. I pull up my pants and feel the lack of one thing as the muffin top reminds me of the persistence of another. Me who's with me always, the pillow of skin and fat that I'd call Rubenesque. It tries its best to cover me. And so I worry over it strange companion. This body that covers me and bleeds all day without ceasing, I say, come on, I say, stop. Like I used to when I'd get too scared of one thing or another. God comes back to find us in the most astonishing ways. Me and my body, who are almost never the same. Come on, I'd say. I wonder if any of you have that experience of the body isn't quite what you imagine it being. And as one gets older, I find, you know, being someone who is trans in uh, many ways and also has not transitioned, that's something I'm thinking about a lot, like what it is to be in an aging body um, that is now, there are processes happening where I, I'm reminded every single day of the body that I just, didn't know, um, didn't know if I really wanted. I had a mane once, a glorious thicket, a generosity for all the cicadas to visit when the rains descended. I let them hornets make a mockery of me. I didn't sweat it. I let them sting and sting because I was enormous and magnanimous. I'd cut my leg and let the maggots build an empire. What did I care, I'd say to the fox, there's enough meat in me to go around. Then I'd stretch so the grubs could find new avenues and they'd shiver with gratitude. They pass out drunk along the edges of the wound. I was my own economy. You could see me coming from miles around and yes, I could break your last best thing in half. And yes, I was every inch an animal, but most days I was merciful. I'd pretend I was sleeping. I'd take all my danger and lay it at the river's edge. Praise house, the new economy. And this is after and for my dear friend, Ross Gay, who I know has spent time with all of you out in Claremont. Another poem to the body I dream of. And I owe it to him. We talk, one of the things this talk is about is the economies of care, the economies of poets. How do we make new economies in our poems and for ourselves? And, and one of them is by saying the names of our poet family, the people we love. Ross Gay is really first and foremost among them. Praise house, the new economy. The rosemary bush blooming its unapashed blue. Also dumplings filled with steam and soup so my mouth fills and I bubble over with laughter. Little things, people kissing on bicycles, being able to walk up the stairs and run back down. Joanna's garden after the long flight to Tel Aviv. Not being detained like everyone thought I would. The man with dreadlocks and a perfect green shirt walking home from work. One cold beer before I drink it and get sick. How peaches mold into compost in a single day, orange to gray to darkness into dirt. Her ankles taste the skin right under the knob, delicate as a tomatillo's shroud. 
all the animals that talk to me, that I finally let them talk to me. The blessing of waking early enough to watch the fox bathe itself. The suction of a man's hands meeting another's on the street, every single person looking up to see them. Bros, yes, but lovely in the golden light, with brims swung to the back. I want shoulders like they have, want my waist to taper to an ass built like the David's. I admit it, this body's not enough for me. Still, I love it. I'll be sure blasting out a Nissan Sentra's windows, bow ties, ridiculous blues, my mother's seizures, specifically that I don't have them, that I can answer Ross's call or not because we live harmonious and are always talking somehow. Tapestry with their gluttony of deer, fig perfume, and also cypress boxer briefs and packing socks and jockey shorts, strap-ons, soft and hard, welcome in her hand and in mine as I greet the real me. The little shop in Provincetown and the speckled dog that licks itself in that fresco of the crucifixion. Mary Oliver, I love her, I really do. The baseball she gave me that says, go socks, though I love the Orioles, Old Bay on all my shrimp and justice, and cities burning if people need to burn them to get free. My grandmother gardening in the late light, Sun Ra, the first time. Paris, even though I've never been there, natal plums, tattoos everlasting, clouds, Orion's belt pushing inside her with both my hands holding myself up, my weight, her grabbing and saying, God, fuck, the neighbors, Casablanca, not knowing anything, angels, mashed potatoes, good red wine. All praise to Mary Oliver, whose name I read just then, and who actually, when I was um, going back and forth to Claremont, that was a brief period in my life where I was spending quite a bit of time with Mary Oliver, who was not who I thought she would be. She was even more radical and, and queer and, um, and astonishing. And she did, she, she uh, sent me a baseball that said, go Sox on it. Cause at that point I was still a Red Sox fan. Now I have turned, I have turned toward the Orioles. I know I, my father is still upset about it. She ties my bow tie. What you thought was the sound of the deer drinking at the base of the ravine was not their soft tongues entering the water, but my love tying my bow tie. We were in our little house just up from the ravine. Forgive yourself. It's easy to mistake her wrists for the necks of deer. Her fingers move so deftly, one could call them skittish, though not really because they aren't afraid of you. I know. You thought it was the deer, but they're so far down, you couldn't possibly hear them. No, this is the breeze my love makes when she ties me up and sends me out into the world. Her breath pulled taut and held until she's through. I watch her in the mirror, not even looking at me. She's so focused on the knot and how to loop the silk into a bow. That's for my um, partner, Angeline. And uh, she, we've been together a long time. We've been together since college. And she said to me one day, she said, you know, I don't tie your bow tie. I fix your bow tie. And I just thought, yeah, but like, what, what kind of poem is called? She fixes my bow tie. I don't know. But I would definitely like to add her to the list of names, the bouquet that I'd like to make tonight of people I love and who make me feel rich even in the poorest times. Neighbor, reckon or cistern, Michael comes to help. Your face at the door, Michael. I put my mask on. You see me through the window and pull up your gator. Now we speak with our eyes shining. Yesterday you were crying, but today we're walking to the backyard with the sun pouring all over our light bodies. I feel my breath through my mask. 
what does it mean to have work for you? Rid of credit and the factory I grew up in, the light pours over us. You say, do you have a belt? It's gonna get annoying, pulling your pants up for emphasis. Michael, I wish I had a body like yours. I've dreamt of a body like yours, adorning my light body, not so tall, muscular. My whole life I've wanted my shirt to fit the way yours does. Do I have a belt? You bet I do. It fits you fine because yours is the kind of waist I dream of. We're laughing. You wear it better than me, I say, with wonder instead of jealousy. Why do I only feel wonder instead of jealousy when it comes to other bodies, but jealousy like a shot of hot sauce on an oyster when it comes to money and success? The leaves fall around us. I can only pay so much, I say. It stretches the word neighbor, so it groans a little bit. I remember hearing if you play Bach on period instruments, the wood pushes to the edge of its possibility. We're like that. Viola da Gamba shuddering in the concert hall, the grain of us shuddering with it. Yesterday you were crying and I sent you away saying, come back tomorrow, I'll have money and work for you then. Tomorrow, I could have offered you a meal. I had pot roast in the fridge. When you were late in coming, I worried and kicked myself. What could have kept you safe if you were in trouble? Me, that's who. Neighbor, we stand in the sunlight. You, the body, my dream of me. It's true. All through this, um, have you had this experience all through the pandemic thinking about like, who do we become close to? How far in do we let people? My neighbor, Michael, came um, looking for work, looking, did I need someone to rake leaves? Did I need someone to pick things up? And I said, no. And he was really in distress. He needed help that day. What is it when we, when we push people away without even meaning to? Um, I shut the door, he was gone, and it took 15 minutes for me to realize I could have made him a meal. I could have said, I don't have anything today, but let me make you supper. Am I any better a person than I was before the pandemic? I just don't know. I think about it all the time. My bones on top of your bones on top of your bones. Not an optimist. I lie awake at night and say the name of everyone on the block and for three blocks over and then the names of people I don't know. I call them by their house numbers, by their street address. I wish they not be sick. I wish they not get shot. I wish it calms me, but also is it selfish? Do I do it to keep myself alive? I have a theory that if I let the light out into the world, then we all get to stay alive, want to stay alive. I think of everything I know about all the people on my block. I list Miss Edna and her children. I say the names of everyone at the church and then the people I don't know. I want everyone to have money. I want everyone to have a house and food and be believed in and told they're believed in. I want to know these things can happen so I don't want to die. Or so I can feel the hollow part of me filling with all of us getting to be filled. I'm not saying this to get some extra credit. I'm saying, I wonder if you do it too. My bones on top of your bones on top of your bones or your bones on top of mine. All of us awake at 3 a.m. wishing the best for people, filling up an endless cistern with light and understanding all the way down to the center of the earth and up to where the empty planes fly past. I wish I could stop and like, just ask you all what you wish for people. A poet who really taught me how to wish things for people is the poet Oliver Bendorf. And I wanna say Oliver Bendorf's right now, name right now. We lost so many people this year. I think one of the reasons that I'm not dreaming um, in my waking life as much, one reason I'm not 
fantasizing as much is um it's been sort of unimaginable the loss of this year and i want to say i want to stop and say right now um for everyone here for all the losses that you've felt even if no one has passed that you know just um just the loss that we've all gone through i just want to hold that say i'm thinking of you i'm thinking of all of us together I've lost a number of friends this year, oddly and terribly not to COVID, just people still died of other things. And um, at the beginning of the year, I lost my great mentor, Ivan Boland, uh, my dear friend, Randall Keenan, the wonderful friend and scholar, Jenny Tunbohot. It made me get sort of think about all the ghosts in my life. Miss you, would like to take a walk with you. Do not care if you just arrive in your skeleton. Would love to take a walk with you. Miss you. Would love to make you shrimp saganaki like you used to make me when you were alive. Love to feed you. Sit over steaming bowls of pilaf, little roasted tomatoes covered in pepper and nutmeg. Miss you. Would love to walk to the post office with you. Bring the ghost dog. We'll walk past the waterfall and you can tell me about the after. Wish you, wish you would come back for a while. Don't even need to bring your skin sack. I'll know you. I know you'll know me, even though I'm bigger now. Grayer, I'll show you my garden. I'd like to hop in the leaf pile you raked, but if you want to jump in, I'll rake it for you. Miss you, standing looking out at the river with your rake in your hand. Miss you in your puffy blue jacket. They're hip now. I can bring you a new one if you'll only come by. No, I told you it was okay to go. No, I told you it was okay to leave me. Why'd you believe me? You always believed me. Wish you would come back so we could talk about truthfulness. Miss you. Wish you would walk through my door, stare out from the mirror, come through the pipes. I've been working on it, making a form called the Miss You. Um, it's kind of a pandemic form, but also it's an all the time form because I'm, I'm just someone, I think I think about the ghosts all the time. I think maybe partially because my mom died so early in my life. Um, but the students I got to be spend time with at Claremont, we worked on the Miss You form together and oh my gosh, they wrote the most beautiful poems. If any of you were here, you both wrote, wrote the most beautiful poems, but, um, yeah. Four long years at court. I really miss the forest and how I used to hide there with the queen. I miss how we used to dance and how we'd run from court. I miss the buttons, oh, her buttons, how they'd shine in the late light when she wasn't looking at me, arriving in the thicket where she'd somehow gotten first. I wish she'd step down for the first time again to greet me in the great hall where all the beasts heads hovered, all the torches lit her from within. I was looking at the white bat, cup the buck's rack, swinging in the firelight like a lantern. I saw its bones, saw the fingers hook onto the antler. There she was, beside me, watching me not see her. You look to your right and time becomes a torch blown huge. It was like that. The bat looked like an otter's stomach blown into a lamp. I told her so, the way you will. If I had turned away toward the ladies dancing, toward the door and walked out to the courtyard toward the axes lined in rows and clean, I miss how we'd walk into the clearings and the caves. The deer walked up from the ravines and stared. I wasn't scared of them or me, even with the things I'd done, not when she was there. I was so enamored of the bat, swinging. I could see its body through the thin shroud of its wings. I thought I could kill it with one hand. There she was, watching me thinking it, watching me shake the thought of other things into the darkness of the hall. She touched my shoulder. Did I sing? Sometimes to myself, sitting by the river or in the night to keep me safe, 
sometimes my name softly to myself to remind me once beside my mother who'd swelled to the size of a sheep. The deer's in the thicket, the fox is in the glade, like that till she'd stop breathing. And after, as I watched the women wash her, not scared anymore, neither one of us, I told her so. How I sang of the fox and of the deer. She held me in the clearing. We could see the towers from there. It feels so long ago and also like yesterday, stepped down from her throne and then together in the forest that fast and also through the hours beside the king turned toward me. I think it as she sat, turned, all the beasts heads waiting, the boar's mouths open, the lynx with its pink tongue, the deer, the deer, the deer, one after another on the walls the hinds and hearts, the ten-point stag I took down as a mercy after the king missed its chest seven times. I killed him as he tried to crawl away. I sang, stop, sang, the deer's in the thicket. As his eyes rolled, the fox is in the glade. I took his antler in my left hand and pulled back. Hey, lolly, lolly, pulled back until he groaned. I miss the moment before it started. The body, just a figment. The deer, nothing but a song I sang beside my mother as she died. It can take forever. You can make a life up in the time it takes to watch your mother die. I was in the glade. No, I was in the bedroom. No, I was nowhere in the story was nowhere to be found. I want her back. I want the castle and the bat. I even want the stag who couldn't make up his mind if he should die or not, if he should let me pull his neck back or not. Get loose and double, I'd sing alone in my room or on the train or as I walk to work. The world around a tapestry. I'd cock my head, I'd see the stag. I'd cock my head, I'd see the men in business suits. I miss the queen, I want her here, beside me. The null points like a glade where she'd lay me down beside the stream. The beetles' armies resting on the rocks, the towers in the distance. Your friends are with you, then they're gone. Your mother's with you, then she's gone. My armor shone all morning by nightfall. It was blood and ash. Hey, lolly, lolly. The fox is in the glade. The debt collector's in the cans of soup. One minute you're a castle. The next you're just a cloud. Turn around. Turn around in the late light. If I cock my head, I see the armies. I could have walked from court and just kept going. Did I sing? Ask the fox or the stag with his neck pulled back. I want it back. What are all the things we want back right now? I want so many people back. I want want my friends who passed this year back. I want my teacher, my mentor, Lucy Barbrotto back seems to me it's interesting this year also has brought all the ghosts back for me and maybe I want a younger body back maybe I want that that vision of the body I wanted and thought I could be miss you would like to grab that chilled tofu that we love do not care if you bring only your light body would just be so happy to sit at the table and talk about the menu Miss you. Wish we could bet which chilies they'll put on that silken pile. Our favorite. Sometimes green, sometimes red. Roasted, we always thought, but so cold and fresh. How did they do it? Wish you could be here to talk about it like it was so important. (laughs) Wish you could. Watched you on the screens as I was walking, as I was cooking. Wished you could get out of the hospital. Can't bring myself to order our dish and eat it in the car. Miss you laughing. Miss you coming in from the cold and one too many meetings. Laughing. 
I'll order already. I'll order seven helpings, some dumplings, those cold yam noodles that you like. You can come in your light body or skeleton or be invisible. I don't even care. No, you have a long way to travel. No, I don't even know if it's long at all. Wish you could tell me what you're reading, if you're reading. Miss you. I'm at the table in the back. I'm gonna read one more poem and I just, I thank you so much uh, for your time, for your presence that I feel in this room. One of the things that um, has always been something that I've thought about a lot, uh, just having been the child of someone who took their life, seems to me there's always a kind of gate open then I thought we were gonna talk about economies tonight, but actually we talk about an imagination, but it, it's a kind of economy. Hammond B3 organ sister. The days I don't wanna kill myself are extraordinary. Deep bass, all the people in the streets waiting for their high fives and leaping. I mean, leaping when they see me. I am the sun-filled god of love, or at least an optimistic undersecretary. There should be a word for it. The days you wake up and do not want to slit your throat. Money in the bank, enough for an iced green tea every weekday and Saturday and Sunday. It's like being in the armpit of a Hammond B3 organ. Just reeks of gratitude and funk. The funk of ages. I am not going to ruin my love's life today. It's like the time I said yes to gray sneakers, but then the salesman said, wait. And there, out of the back room, like the bakery's first biscuits, bright blue kicks. Iridescent, like a scarab. Oh, who am I kidding? It was nothing like a scarab. It was like bright blue fucking sneakers. I did not want to die that day. Oh my God, why don't we talk about it? how good it feels. And if you don't know, then you're lucky, but also you poor thing. Bring the band out on the stoop. Let the whole neighborhood hear. Come on, everybody, say it with me nice and slow. No pills, no cliff, no brains on the floor. Bring the bass back. No rope, no hose, not today, Satan. Every day I wake up with my good fortune and news of my demise. Don't keep it from me. Why don't we have a name for it? Bring the bass back. Bring the band out on the stoop. Hallelujah. I can't thank you enough for making space for me and for helping me think about economies and all of our life together. I can't wait to talk to you. And I want to, again, thank Will and Nandini and Priya and Chloe and Brian. It's great to be back at Claremont. Thank you so much, Gabby, for creating this incredibly warm space and sharing your poetry with all of us. Now we're going to segue into some audience questions. So I want to encourage everyone to send in any and all questions in the Q&A portion right on the bottom of your screens. So the first question is, how can we use our imagination or daydreaming to come into our truest self? Is our imagination a delusion or a practice to become our truest self? I'm going to fall on the floor right now. That's the first question. That's so good. Does it say who asked it? No. Well, I want to say whoever asked it is my dream question asker. And I just, um, will you read it again, Nandini? Because I really want to, this is really something I think about all the time. Yeah, of course. So it's how can we use our imagination or daydreaming to come into ourself? Is, it, is our imagination a delusion or a practice to become our truest self? Yes. I'm going to say the answer to that is yes on both counts. I mean, I guess, I guess maybe it's a delusion, but how many remarkable delusions, you know, have created extraordinary art, have created extraordinary possibilities, things that have been called delusion, right? I would say that I lived in a space of what my family would have called delusion much of my life when I said, um, I, I am, I am male. I am male and I am, I am both of these things. And people did not think they would have said I was delusional. And yet 
finally I was able to dream myself, my whole life I had dreamt myself into this vessel. And then one day I was able to come out into that vessel. And that was, a, that was both a moment of um, maybe high delusion, but also a moment where that dreaming and dreaming and dreaming like made a whole different world possible for me. I also think that, um, gosh, I love this question, whoever you are. Um, I also think that, you know, I think that this moment right now is one that I wish I could be um, really daydreaming a lot in and really fantasizing a lot in. And it's surprising to me that I haven't been able to because because throughout my life daydreaming and and I mean, and I really was a daydreamer. I mean, I, people may have said when I was young, I had even sort of dissociated, but I I used that to to not just like become the artist I was, but really to save my life, to make a whole other world for myself. And um, there's a way in which I wish I could I could do that now. And my hope is that when I go out in the world and I'm sort of more and you know touching the things of this world and not just sitting in my home, that all those smells and touches and tastes and everything will come back to me and and then I will go into the the grand delusion of it again and and hopefully not just make um, good art, but I also think that there's something for me at least, I don't know if you feel this way too, the person who wrote this question or other people, I think there's also something about daydream and fantasy that makes me a better citizen. Um, and I'm, I'm ready to be a better citizen. Our next question is, how do you read the band leader poem aloud with the distinctive symbol that's printed there? I tried and kept confusing myself and making assumptions. Thank you. Ooh. I love that you made assumptions. You probably just made your sound. Like this is the thing. I wish we were all there together reading aloud um, because I, I think that there's no assumption. I think that, uh, so I'm gonna show for people who haven't seen the book, um, you know, I really, I really have grown up in a space where like, if I'm honest, I have divested myself from pronouns because the idea of male and female, like I'm just all kinds of different things in any different day. And so when I was writing this book, there were a series of poems where I didn't use a pronoun, I used a symbol. And then I kind of mark it with an intake of breath. And I'll read just a, a moment. Um, I like it when oh, touches me there, right above the forehead with whose whole palm and moves whose hand along my skull until it rests below my neck and sort of holds me there and how we stay like that before it even starts right there in the stillness, like the best part of the movie when the lights go down and everyone sort of shakes together and relaxes. I like it when who starts to want thing right before oh, tells me what oh, wants and how oh, wants it before oh, sighs and says my name like a surprise and starts to move who's hips and oh, ask me how I do it. Oh God, right there like that in the stillness. Oh, sounds just like a girl. I could go on, but one thing I think you can, when I read it, right, is um, it's all different ways. And it actually found, sounded a little false, I think, to me when I first read it, because I was in the middle of something else, right? But also it's just like how my breath was. So um, I tend to do an intake of breath. I know other people who do, who, when they do it, do an outtake of breath. And, and one thing I will say that is really interesting to me is that, um, I get a lot of letters from people about those poems and particularly I get a lot of um, letters, which is very interesting to me from women in their sixties. And they tend to tell me like how old they are very often heterosexual women in their sixties, uh, which I think is interesting. And um, they almost always say the same thing. They say, I, I take the book, I read it alone and I read my sound. I make my sound or I read my sound. And I think that's very beautiful and interesting. And so I think whatever sound you're making, assume all you want because, because it's a space of welcome, that space. You talked a lot about like your body. Um, and I wanted to know if you think men think as much about their bodies as women or non-binary people tend to? Oh, this is so good. Nandini, is this a question or is it somebody else asking it or are you asking it? This is me. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. I had a feeling, right? It's like when you're asking the question it feels more just sort of like differently. Um, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that question and I wouldn't wanna presume. I will say that I think that, I think those of us who are non-binary I think those of us, uh, so I think those of us who are non-binary, and I don't want to speak for anyone else, I'm just speaking for myself, so I would say for myself, 
part of thinking all about my body all the time really was like imagining a different space for myself and, and a different way of a different mode of being um, a new, a different world for that. So I do think there, are, and I, and I think that maybe that's true for a lot of non-binary people is just like sort of imagining like the vessel that you make for yourself that is often like devalued by the rest of the world. Well, I I'm thinking about it all the time because I'm, I'm valuing it. I'm, I'm burnishing it. I'm, I'm, um, I also will say that I just think, and Nandini, I'd be interested if you agree with this. I just think that that those of us, I mean, I think that those of us who have found ourselves under threat and where our, the safety of our bodies is just like, not only never assured, but just like, it is perilous to be in, in certain bodies. Like, I think that that, that is a way in which, um, I've always thought about my body because like, I just lived for a long time in a space where just I, when I was young, I did not know from day to day if I would be alive the next day. I really didn't. And, and still, you know, if I'm walking down the street, if I'm, you know, dressed like this in certain spaces. Um, so I think, I think I think of my body maybe more than some people because I am imagining a different possibility for it. And then I think I also think of my body a lot because I'm consistently having to figure out like how to keep it safe um, and like what other people are thinking of my body all the time. Does that make sense, Nandini? Would you agree with that? Or like, would you, like, would you say, would you have a different reading of that? No, I think you're so right. I think some people are more policed over their bodies and have to be more careful than others. And I think you put it really well. But I also think, I think this is really, Nandini, you're blowing my mind. Like this is something that's important to me that I think you said is important. I also think that, isn't it interesting that as some of us think about our bodies more and more, there's also an incredible effort, right? To police our ability to think about our bodies and fantasize about our bodies. So like on one hand, we're always thinking of our bodies because we're in danger. And then there's this force that, it, that presses down upon us to also uh, try and sort of break our various avenues of imagination toward pleasure and, and toward imagining liberation for our bodies. So it's, it's complicated. Oh, these questions are good. The next question comes in from a student asking, can you talk more about putting imagination into practice? That sounds like manifestation to me. Maybe we can draw a connection to creating economies of care. How have you been building and how do we build that economy? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I will say this, like, when I think about poets who I think do this so extraordinarily well, I think of um, Oliver Baez Bendorf. I think of um, the extraordinary poet, <clears throat> Destiny Hempel, uh, the poet C.A. Conrad, certainly um, the poet Lucille Clifton, right? Po there are so many um, remarkable poets that give us examples within their own poems of how we reach out to each other, how we hold on to each other. Um, literally like Destiny Hempel in her poems will talk about like how we, how mutual aid works, how we give things to one another, how we give each other permission um, to not feel as though we are in debt or that we, we are living within a system of credit, but where we are just always indebted to each other, right? So I think, I think that one of the things we can do in our poems is we can populate them in such a way, either with um, other people, as in the case of Destiny Hempel, um, with someone like C.A. Conrad, we have the remarkable poem, Glitter in My Wounds. Do you know that poem? Um, Glitter in My Wounds by C.A. Conrad. Um, where like there's there's the the figure of the tree and how the tree becomes part of one's imaginative community and and the human self is decentralized that creates a whole other kind of economy when we decentralize ourselves in the poem and let other beings come forward um, and I think that that that's also a way that imagination can work one of the things I like to do is um, I like to uh, when I'm working with students or even in my own practice like draw a scene like draw a scene uh, of memory for myself, draw all the details I can think of, everything, 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 write down lists, write down all kinds of examples. And then what I like to do is um, not put myself in the center as I often do, but either take myself out entirely and like look at that scene without me or, and write from that space or put myself like a little bit off to the side and put something else in the center. Um, it seems like such a little thing to do, but I think one of the things that 
we can do in our poetic practice and in our imaginative practice and that you know these poets that i've mentioned do is that we can um we can amplify what is sort of most glorious about ourselves by decentralizing ourselves right and by letting other kinds of 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 togetherness other um other economies come forward um, and create uh, a different kind of space, a different kind of relationship to power. It's amazing how many of our poems, even as we're talking about caring for others are still profoundly hierarchical, um, are still profoundly, um, I think, bound up in notions of predatory capitalism and value systems uh, that are aligned with predatory capitalism. I think if I think of poets like Destiny Hempel, uh, Oliver Bayes Bendorf, Lucille Clifton, C.A. Conrad, these are poets I look at and I think like, they're actually doing something in their poems that are, that's like deeply, deeply breaking down hierarchies and helping us imagine like new ways to live, like not as, not just as people, but as, as communities and societies. Thanks so much for that question. That was really good. Mm. I think this is the last question we're gonna have time for tonight, but it's from a student asking, most of the poems you read touch on themes that beginner poets might shy away from. How do you overcome feelings which might stop you from publicly expressing your feelings and experiences on sensitive topics? First, I wanna thank you for that question. I'd like to thank the student. I'd like to thank, cause I know like after this we're gonna disappear. And I just wanna say, I wanna thank all the students. I wanna thank just everyone who's here tonight. Um, you know, I kind of really do think we're all beginner poets. Um, I think there's probably a lot of people rolling their virtual eyes right now or like, because it's all dark, like they're just like, mm-hmm. But it's true, like I do think that one of the things that has helped me to talk about these things that are difficult for me to talk about and talk about things that maybe are difficult to talk about in poems or people don't do so often, like is to think of myself as not an expert on anything really, you know, like I have a sort of permanent beginner's mind and that um, what I wanna be is in communication with you, right? It doesn't mean that I want to write poems necessarily that are completely accessible or that like, I, you know, that don't have their challenges or aren't difficult in some way. But, um, you know, I was someone who like, I was super lonely growing up. I was someone who in middle school, like I, I've said this in the interviews and stuff, but like I spent most of my lunches, like eating lunch in the girl's bathroom. Like there were like the unpopular kids. Like, do you know this? Like, do, do you think this is true? There are the unpopular kids who like were friends with all the other unpopular kids. And so like, they were cool in a way and like had their own world. And then there was like someone like me, like I didn't have a friend in the world, like not a friend in the world. And I say this because like, I wasn't someone who didn't want to have friends. Like I, I really had no one and I really wanted to talk to someone. And so I think that one of the things I try and do in my poems and in spaces like this and just in the world, and it's hard, it's really, and it's getting harder for me in these times of the pandemic, um, is I try to just like be open because I think that there's a lot of things that I wanna talk about and that I'm scared to talk about that like probably also you might wanna talk about too. And if we could talk about them together, then then the people who don't want us to talk about those things, like the people who don't want us to talk about suicide, they don't want us to talk about mental illness, they don't want us to talk about um, trans identity, they don't want us to talk about racialized violence. Like if we just like open up and look at each other and, and talk about those things with each other, those people have no power. I mean, it doesn't mean they can't like kill us still, <laughs> do terrible things to us, but but we can like dream together and there's, and be honest with each other and be vulnerable with each other. And that like, there's a kind of power to that. I really believe that is, um, it cannot be matched by hatred. It just can't be. Um, and I say, this is someone like, I've had a lot of people hate me. Um, I still just like, I'm gonna always talk about my mom dying and I'm always gonna talk about my body. And I'm always gonna listen as you talk about both of those things too. And anything else you wanna to talk to me about. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight.
A special thanks to Professor Calva, uh, excuse me, Calva Caressi and to all those who sent in questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual ETH event, which will be tomorrow, Tuesday, April 6th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Todd Kashdan, professor of psychology at George Mason University, will join us to discuss sustainable happiness. See you all then.